printed and then they can get seen. My Lord. Yes, good morning, Mr. Mason, Ms. Morris. Um, in a sense, I should start by saying thank you very much for coming, because uh, uh, in a sense, it's my fault. Um, my antennae twitched, and I thought, well, I can't decide this without hearing from the parties, so here you are. Um, um, so I, I should start with an apology, but uh, I think it is uh, a point that needs to be or points that need to be thrashed out. We've obviously read the papers um, and I think have a, a lively appreciation of what the issues are. And we were just going to um, turn it over to you. I've assumed that between you, you've worked out um, how long you need and um, and so on. Indeed, um, we, there was some uncertainty as to whether this is a day or half a day. Um, we rather hoped that it was half a day. We, we, we did rather hope it was half a day. And, and um, um, <laughs> if we all hoped that it was half a day, if, if we stay as quiet as we can, then perhaps it will be half a day. I think the points boil down into relatively short compass, and happily there are not very many relevant authorities, I don't think. So both of those two things, I think, point to reasonable speed. Indeed, my lord. And I had really risen mainly to introduce everyone and then uh, say uh, that I presume the court wanted to hear from uh, Ms. Morris first. But uh, we're, of course, in, in the hands of the court. So I'm, I'm reading Mr. Dillon. Well, I think, Ms. Morris and I think yeah. speaking for myself, I had envisaged Ms. Morris mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, dealing with it first. Uh, I don't know if my lady said a different view. No, we, we, that's a, a unanimous view. So, Ms. Morris, it, it, that's a unanimous view. So over to you. Certainly. We, there are two aspects to uh, the matters upon which I'm going to address you this morning. The first is, are we entitled to advance our case before you, um, in addition to the matters where we already have permission to appeal, by way of respondent's notice, or must we do so by way of cross-appeal? Uh, the second aspect of the case only arises um, if you're not with us in relation to the respondent's notice point, and it's if we must cross-appeal, uh, should we have permission and should time be extended. So uh, sticking with what I'm calling the <coughs> respondent's notice point, uh, the first uh, part of my submissions, I'm going to uh, draw the court's attention to uh, two aspects of the substantive claim. Firstly, the nature of the claim, uh, because that's certainly a feature of uh, my Lord or Justice Coulson's um, observations to us when his antennae twitched. And secondly, key elements of the process that was adopted by the court below and the parties. So sticking with the nature of the claim, first of all. Uh, it was a claim for damages, effectively for breach of the procurement rules. Um, and I can see uh, my lady's turned up the bundle. Um, uh, if it helps at all, the amended particulars of claim are at tab one. Uh, now, uh, there were uh, lots of things said uh, by the claimant, um, but what um, ended up being material uh, was uh, their allegation of manifest error. Now, uh, we have uh, their schedule of manifest error with our responses at page 18. And so we can see there that they allege quite a few manifest errors. In the event, they did not win on any of those. They only won on a manifest error which was articulated and identified and made out at the trial stage. But certainly, they had a claim um, of manifest error. Now, our defence to their claim for damages uh, for these various breaches included not only saying these weren't breaches, but they were not sufficiently serious to entitle them to an award of damages. And that's what's being called the Frankovich issue. Now, the way that we analysed the case, and indeed that it was analysed below, was that the Frankovich issue 
was part of the liability issues which fell to be decided by the court in the first part of this split trial. And so, uh, although um, clearly uh, the Frankovich element is one that doesn't arise in ordinary uh, common law cases, it is um, our contention, which um, was certainly the assumption of the parties in the court below, that it's part of the question, are you liable? And we articulated it as a defence. And in that sense, although these analogies are really rather crude and inelegant, it's just like causation or volentile or whatever it is. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid my negligence is a bit sketchy, but it, <laughs> it, it ends up in that bundle. Yeah, yeah. It's not what happens at the damages stage. Now, uh, you will have seen, having read uh, uh, the papers, that the parties were uh, very sensibly by uh, the court directed to agree a list of issues. Uh, we've got a list of issues for that first trial, uh, and I can give you uh, the reference, uh, my lady. 28? Uh, yes. They, that included the Frankovich issue. So, you know, very experienced procurement judge splits the trial, um, and we're directed to produce these uh, uh, list of issues, and everybody again agrees that Frankovich is far past that first bundle, for want of a better expression. And uh, we go ahead um, and have a trial, and there is a judgment at the conclusion of that, and we've got that judgment uh, at uh, page 33 of the bundle, and the relevant extract is in our skeleton argument at page 180 of the bundle that's been prepared for this court. And what happens, as I uh, prefigured, is that uh, a, an issue crystallises at the trial, which is um, in the nature of a finding of a manifest error. Now, at the conclusion of the trial, the parties have made submissions about the application of the question of whether or not any particular failing was sufficiently serious. But what the first instance judge <coughs> says very fairly is, well, you haven't addressed me precisely on how the sufficiently serious question um, plays out in relation to this specific finding, which I have made, which no one precisely anticipated and therefore no one precisely addressed me upon. So he says, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, give you some time to come back, but still as part of the first liability hearing, and make some submissions about that. Uh, now, no declaration, for example, is made about liability at that stage. And so if I go back to my uh, rather crude negligence case mm -hmm. analogy, we still haven't got into the second trial bundle. We're still in bundle one. But there are recitals that there could are, have been part there of. There are recitals, yes. Now, um, the question, though, and I don't want to take my submissions too much out of order, but to respond to my lady, is that uh, that um, those recitals were not decisive of the liability issue. They were, to use the language, steps along the way. I'm afraid there are sort of there's a multiplicity of metaphors in the case law, uh, and um, one of the phrases that's sometimes used is pregnant with legal consequences. Now, um, we would say that these recitals are as pregnant with a legal consequence as any other finding of fact. Unless it's a, a, a preliminary issue or something which is decisive. So, for example, if at that stage we had been 100% successful and therefore there were no breaches and there were no manifest errors, then, of course, there would be something that could be appealed against. But we say that these recitals um, uh, uh, don't become pregnant if that's the um, if that's the test that we're applying. But we're still in liability stage, and we haven't got to the end of that. And there's nothing um, for us to appeal about because also for these procedural and sort of uh, overriding objective reasons, which is rather than coming and troubling a lord and ladyships, we um, have got a decent chance on sufficiently serious 
and it's much more sensible to proceed and deal with that at first instance. So um, everyone then proceeds to have a hearing on uh, the Frankovich issue, at the conclusion of which uh, the trial judge uh, decides that uh, they are indeed uh, this isolated manifest error is not sufficiently serious um, for the defendant to be found liable uh, and he makes an order which we have at page 77 of the bundle and it's um, the relevant part is extracted at paragraph 14. There is then a uh, consequentials hearing um, to tie up all the multiple loose ends which we address at paragraph 15 of our skeleton argument <clears throat> and uh, we say that it's perhaps worth noting um, what the how the judge explains retrospectively what took place and this is in the middle of our paragraph 15 uh, at the time of the original trial there was to be no separation of the Frankovich issue and had I been able to determine it there would have been an order with a single outcome, either dismissing the claimant's claim for damages or concluding that it was entitled to a remedy in damages. And then he goes on to say, the success was a mere step along the way with no ultimate consequence. And we say that that is the correct analysis and um, will be material when we come on to uh, respond to my Lord, Lord Justice Coulson's thoughtful points uh, raised uh, in his directions to, to us to come and discuss the issues today. Uh, and then there was a further uh, uh, order then after that consequentials hearing and it's referred to at paragraph 18 in our skeleton and for your uh, reference it's at 94. So uh, it, at that point um, there had been uh, consideration on our part we thought rightly and also reflection with the court and the other parties as to how appellate issues ought to be addressed. Uh, and uh, what um, uh, no one disagreed with, if I can put it that way at this stage, was that uh, the claimant would um, make its application for permission to appeal, some of which um, it was successful on before the trial judge, and some of which then came to this court. Um, and that we would be in the position of responding to that uh, by way of a respondent's notice um, and that we were not required to cross appeal because uh, we were not challenging uh, uh, something other than uh, uh, seeking to defend the order on liability which we had secured by way, in part, of our uh, sufficiently serious defence, but also because the other breaches have been rejected. Uh, so, uh, two points to take away from that. One is, analytically, as a matter of law, Frankovich issue, it feels a bit strange and exotic, but analytically, it is part of the question, are we liable? Secondly, as a matter of uh, practice uh, and as a matter of the way in which the court below exercised its discretion to manage the proceedings and with the consent of the parties, the case was structured and managed so that the Frankovich issue was part of liability. Um, as uh, my lady, Lady Justice Simler, has noted, um, yes, there were recitals, there was no order, um, uh, and it, certainly, for example, the issue of manifest error wasn't a, hadn't been identified, for example, as a preliminary issue, which might have put a different complexion on things. But that's not how the court either structured the, the litigation in advance or chose to frame the orders that it made in response to what took place. <clears throat> so uh, that's what I have to say about analysis of the law and the uh, exercise of discretion in relation to the process. So <clears throat> turning now to the law, and as my Lord, um, Lord Justice Coulson has observed, mercifully we don't have to look at too much of it. Uh, but there are uh, a few cases, and there's a difference between myself and Mr Moser, because he says, oh, well, really, the only case that's relevant is Wolfe, 
We don't agree with that. And in fact, Wolf does go through the old authorities. And so I'm going to ask you to take a little bit of time with them, although uh, we don't go too much further in, in, in what we have to say than what is in our skeleton. So first of all, uh, the CPR, uh, we have right at the back of the bundle of authorities uh, at tab 12. It's page 567 of that bundle. So <clears throat> 5213, there's a discretion in a respondent to file and serve a respondent's notice. But uh, at two, where the respondent is seeking itself um, permission to appeal, or where it wishes to ask the appeal court to uphold the decision of the lower court for reasons different from, or additional to those given by the lower court, it must file a respondent's notice. So uh, we saw ourselves um, as uh, falling within that class of respondents who are asking this court to uphold the decision of the lower court, namely, were we liable in damages for reasons different from or additional to, and they included um, our reasons why um, the decision in relation to manifest error was wrong um, for um, uh, the, the matters that are set out in the first few grounds of our respondents' notice. And the reason why we did that <clears throat> was on analysis, uh, it's part of the liability question, it's part of how the judge came to that conclusion, uh, and secondly, procedurally, that's how the claim was structured. Now, <clears throat> uh, the other uh, part of um, uh, that framework uh, to which I draw your attention is the practice direction which we have extracted in our skeleton argument of paragraph 21, and that's page 184. <coughs> This is practice direction 52C. That's exactly correct. Paragraph 8. Paragraph and it says, 8. Yeah. Yes. Eight but I'm one. just looking at it in I'm just looking at it in the, in the white book. Thank As you. the editor I'm entitled to do that even though we no longer provide white books in court. <laughs> yeah. Paragraph 8. Yes. A respondent who seeks to appeal against any part of the order made by the court below must file an appeal notice. And then uh, three, a respondent who seeks to contend that the order of the court below should be upheld for reasons other than those given by the court must file a respondent's notice. So we say, well, the order is you're not liable, um, and therefore there isn't anything that we would be appealing about in relation to that. We're very happy. However, insofar as <clears throat> Mr. Moses' uh, team are seeking to challenge that order, we think there are some other good reasons uh, which uh, the court uh, didn't get right uh, about why that order should stand in our favour. So, for example, um, uh, it's possible that this court might say, well, the judge got it completely wrong and sufficiently serious, but um, looking at manifest error, uh, you, uh, Miss Morris, were right um, on behalf of your client, and you win because there wasn't a manifest error. Um, you don't need to win on sufficiently serious. So that's how we understood it. So <clears throat> turning to the... Can we just, before we leave that, para 8, sub para 2, a respondent who seeks a variation of the order of the lower court must file an appeal notice and must obtain permission to appeal. You say you're not in that one, obviously. We're not asking it to be varied because the order is... It depends which order you're talking about, because we've got potentially two orders. We've got the June one and the September one, haven't we? So I completely understand that you say the September, I think it's September, is the material one where the claim is dismissed. Yes. Um, but going back to my lady's point, if you've looked at the June order, mm. just what do you say about the proposition that that does contain some recitals, at least, that you are asking to be varied? Well, if we... Um if we look at the way in which the case law tells us we fine. ought to understand That's fine. That's that fine. question, That's fine. Yeah. Um, I can perhaps give you a slightly more elegant answer, uh, but I certainly won't forget it. <clears throat> and if I do, please 
No, no, it was just looking at, at aid. You'll understand why it seems no, to be I under, you need I, to pick up para two as well. I, I completely understand, my lady. I mean, at, again, to prefigure what I'm going to say, uh, it is that at that stage, it was a step along the way. It was like a finding of fact. It wasn't something decisive. Now, certainly, a finding of fact can, in certain circumstances, for example, if it's a preliminary issue, either because as a matter of analysis, because that's the way the parties of the court have framed it procedurally, but again, we're just not in that territory in this case. Uh, so, I uh, could just, sorry, just, could, could um, either side have appealed that order at that stage, asked the judge to hold off because either side took issue with, with the recitals? Could they have done that at that stage? Lady, I think we might have come up against the reverse of what my Lord, Lord Justice Coulson said to us in relation to this appeal. And that's perhaps why this situation is so tricky. So imagine the situation that I've given my lady where perhaps the, the, the trial hadn't been divided in the way that it yeah. had. So perhaps um, when Mr Justice Fraser looked at it, he said, oh, well, actually, let's sort out all the breaches yeah. and manifest error. And all these things you've got to say about sufficiently serious, we'll deal with them at a different stage. Damages. Well, then precisely, we would have had an order, and I would say that that would then be engaged um, on the basis of the way in which the court exercised its discretion to structure the case. So we'd be in the um, territory of, of one of the cases where um, uh, uh, Lady Hale, for example, emphasises the nature of judicial discretion and, and the materiality. Equally, uh, for example, even had the case been structured in the way that Mr Justice Fraser had structured it, um, it might have been the case that um, everyone anticipated just how tricky all the sufficiently serious stuff was going to be. And at that stage, when there was a decision or manifest error, we might have all got together or even one, one party persuaded the judge for him to say, I'm going to make a declaration about manifest error so that you can go to the Court of Appeal and get that sorted out before we start worrying about sufficiently But you say there'd have had to be a declaration. It wouldn't have been enough just for there to be a recital in uh, an order, order that was a step along the Absolutely, way. my lady. So I say, and I say it really, all, it works analytically um, that we would say that inherent in uh, the claim for damages for effectively breaches the procurement rules in this case, as a matter of analysis, um, the Frankovich issue is part of liability, but that doesn't alter the fact that the court would have had discretion, I don't know, to make it a sort of three-part trial or at the end of the first um, bit of the hearing say, well, actually, we think it's better to do it this way now. So the fact, we, our primary case is analytic, this is how it sits, but there is a uh, supporting case which relates to what, in fact, was done in the circumstances of this case, which is to group these things together and make orders consequential upon that. And we say, again, borrowing <clears throat> from uh, 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 what was said by Dame Elizabeth butler Sloss when she was president, uh, which is um, one also has to look at the overriding objective. Uh, and uh, applying that in this case, it was sensible um, uh, and in accordance with the overriding objective to get on and uh, sort out uh, the sufficiently serious point um, at that stage, rather than stop that whole process below, come here uh, and have an interlude or manifest error first before going any further. Well, we're coming back to overriding objective. I can well understand that submission that, that at the time it was important to get on with it. But the question of the overriding objective may come back in if you're right. Uh, and on this case, the uh, uh, defendant can reopen all the matters of fact which the judge has already decided against the defendant. Well, my lord, that proposition, uh, which we agree must be engaged with seriously, uh, we say has two aspects to it. Um, and I want to deal uh, first, again slightly prefiguring my submissions, with the second part of it, namely reopening matters of fact. So although I'll come to it later, if I can put it very briefly, we say that those initial grounds that we have are not only matters of fact. So first of all, there is a, a distinct issue of law, namely, how should a court 
that identifies a manifest error approach the remarking exercise if the court decides to remark? And, and we can see that there, um, uh, just from Mr. Moses' skeleton, that there are two clear alternatives. Yes. Um, you, you, I don't want to interrupt you and take you out of your course. You'll come back to that when we'll we're looking at the detail. So My point was a point of principle, because if you're right, it, it, in that sense, it doesn't matter what particular points you are actually making in your respondent's notice. Well, my Lord, you, could so have, you could have said, well, because of the way in which this happened, this is all defensive, so I can rerun every point uh, in my respondent's notice, as a matter of principle. So, my Lord, engaging with that, that first part, which is what is a, a defendant entitled to do, uh, we say that if you have a, a, a non frivolous or vexatious point following what the court said in uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it but I'm going to say Sinoga uh, if you have a non frivolous or vexatious point you're entitled to run it and again as the court acknowledged in that case uh, that's because uh, if you are defending an order where you are the successful party you are in a special position uh, and you ought not to be in a position which is worse um, by virtue of the fact that you are the winner. There's a sort of absurdity in that. So again, uh, if one uh, tests, for example, uh, what we are saying uh, about uh, the way in which this procurement case worked, uh, uh, we can give you um, uh, an example in the common law. Uh, because if one suggests, as it appears it, it appears to be uh, possible, that a, a Frankovich element in a case um, means that um, if you succeed on a Frankovich basis, uh, at, you are cut out from uh, challenging aspects of the decision leading up in the sort of in the, the pre-dromal phase before you get to the, the Frankovich issue then you are being put in a worse position than a defendant in a breach of contract or, or, or negligence claim. Uh, if you have a non-vexatious, non-frivolous ground, then you are entitled to raise it in your respondent's notice. Now, it's a, a separate question, which I know I have to address um, uh, my Lord and my ladies on in, in, in a moment about uh, the character of our grounds. But we say we are in the territory of non-frivolous, non-vexatious. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody's suggesting you're shut out. It's a question of whether the permission filter applies. Well, um, I'm going to show you the, the case law, but we oh. say there is robust authority. I think it's Lord Justice Waller, but I'll, I'll, I'll remind myself as we go through, saying you are in a special position. So, uh, my Lord, although I, I, I entirely understand my Lord's sense of unease, which is, well, how come you're better off? Um, what the courts have told us is, well, you are you are a bit better off, um, and you're in, and you're entitled to be because you're the winner and you're defending your win. Yeah, uh, thank you. So, uh, going back to the bundle of authorities, I'm not sure we ever really got started. Uh, really, it's uh, uh, four cases: Lake, B, Sinoga, and Wolf. Uh, Lake is tab one. It's uh, rather uh, antiquated. Court of Appeal case um, uh, when um, adultery was uh, required to be proved, or one of the elements of uh, uh, requiring to be proved in a divorce case. And I'd invite your attention to 150 of the report. Uh, and about a third of the way down, uh, it's um, uh, Lord Evershed, Master of the Rolls. Um, he says that nothing has persuaded him that by the words judgment or order in the rule or where they occur in the Judicature Act is meant anything other than the formal judgment or order which is drawn up and disposes of the proceedings and which in appropriate cases the successful party is entitled to enforce or execute. So it's, there's a, a degree of concreteness there. It's like what, what disposes of the proceedings and what gives um, the successful party something um, uh, to, to use. 
Now, um, uh, going down the page, we can see that uh, in, in Lake, uh, the, one of the uh, factual issues was whether the wife had committed adultery. Yeah. And what she had sought to do, which led to this out into the Court of Appeal, was uh, to challenge that finding of fact. But what the court said is, look, um, you were successful uh, in your case. You've got an order in your favor, and therefore uh, it is, um, there is no jurisdiction for us in the Court of Appeal to look at this finding of adultery. So um, if we try and map that across uh, to our case, uh, it would be that um, the court would be saying to us, look, you've been successful um, in uh, a finding, securing a finding that you're not liable. We don't have jurisdiction to look at the question of uh, manifest error. Uh, and although that's rather an old case in the divorce case, it's one which is um, uh, looked at repeatedly uh, in uh, the subsequent case law. So the next case to which I draw your attention is behind tab two. It's another family case. Um, it's about care proceedings in REB. Uh, it's another um, appellate case, uh, and it's um, the president, um, Dame Elizabeth Butler-Sloss, as I mentioned. Uh, and I'd in there invite your attention to page 793 of the report. Uh, now, in this case, uh, uh, there was an appeal against a series of findings of fact, essentially in relation to what the relevant parents were said to have done, which uh, uh, was challenged before uh, the uh, conclusion of the proceedings as well, i.e. deciding what the consequences of those findings of fact would be for the children in uh, that case. Uh, and what um, the president said was uh, uh, she there emphasized the importance of process and the overriding objective, which is given that at the conclusion of these proceedings, a decision is going to be made as to whether these children should stay with their parents or not, essentially. Um, if there is a substantial appeal about those findings of fact, um, then it's in accordance um, uh, with the overriding objective for that to be addressed uh, before you go on to decide essentially whether the children should stay with their parents or not. Uh, and so, uh, so, for example, you've got her between C and D uh, uh, saying this, that it would fly in the face of common sense an approach to dispose of litigation, which would be totally contrary to Lord Wolfe's proposals and the new civil procedure approach which permeates civil litigation certainly within the family division. And then, I'm satisfied for my part that the way in which this case was presented to the court was by way of a hearing of a preliminary issue. Uh, the preliminary issue was that of causation. The decision, which was very much dependent upon the medical evidence, was crucial to the final decision of the court as to where this child should live and with whom. Um, and then again, between G and H on that page, um, such issues which are determined as a preliminary part of the case um, and so on and so forth. So you see the, the point there. That was a case um, where the issue um, was in the nature of a preliminary issue. Uh, now the next case... So uh, translating that into this case, it might be said against you that this was in effect a preliminary issue on the way to, the, to determination of the Frankovich liability. Milady, it, it could be said, but of course what weighs against that is no one at any stage called it a preliminary issue. But, but nor did they in this case. That's in, absolutely In fact, right. the judge made no declaration in this case, in B. But, uh, Milady, the, the other difficulty, I would say, for those who say that this is in the nature of a preliminary issue, uh, is uh, this question of how you decide something being one step along the way um, or something which is pregnant with legal consequences. So it's a sort of hideously mixed metaphor. Um, inevitably, it's going to depend on the circumstances of the individual case. And we say, uh, without wishing to continue to where analytically, this is all part of liability. 
And secondly, where as a matter of process, it was part of that, it would be wrong to shut us out of our special position as a defender of a, an order in our favour uh, by constructing um, uh, a view of the case which was contrary both to the legal analysis and to the process that was adopted by the court and the parties. Uh, and so um, can I then ask you uh, to take a tiny bit longer, please, with uh, Sinoga behind tab three. Uh, court of Appeal in 2002, um, Lord Justices Waller and Tucky and uh, Lady Justice Hale, as she then was. Um, uh, and what uh, the court does is go through with quite a lot of care um, the case law, including that which I've just shown at the court. Um, if I could ask you to look at in the judgment starting at page 321, there's a heading discussion. So uh, paragraph 26 uh, identifies um, your jurisdiction. Um, then 27, um, they refer to Lake and Lake. And then the way in which um, Lord Justice Waller analyzes Lake, we see at the bottom of the page just by H. Um, and this is uh, a uh, great phrase. Lake and Lake properly understood means that if the decision, when properly analyzed, and if it were to be recorded in a formal order, would be one that the would-be appellant would not be seeking to challenge or vary, then there's no jurisdiction to attain an appeal. That is, in my view, consistent with Re B, which we've looked at. That this is so is not simply by virtue of interpretation of the words judgment or order, but as much to do with the fact that the court ha only has jurisdiction to entertain an appeal. A loser in relation to a judgment or order or determination has to be appealing if the court is to have any jurisdiction at all. Thus, if the decision of the court on the issue it has to try, or the judgment or order of the court in relation to the issue it has to try, is one which a party does not wish to challenge in the result, it's not open to that party to challenge a finding of fact simply because it's not one, it's not one he or she does not like. And of course, what I've been saying is the issue in our case is, were you liable? So paragraph 28, uh, the decision on a preliminary issue will be a Sorry, pause there, putting language. So you say there was nothing to appeal until you get the dismissal. Until, claim, yeah, until, until they put in their appeal notice exactly. against the dismissal. Of yeah, the claim. because we're the winner. And we've yeah. won on you the might issue. not like the reasons, but you're the winner. Yeah. Okay. So we'd be like the, the, the adulterous wife, effectively, who yeah. wanted to... Yeah. So we might, we might not like the fact that there's a finding that made a manifest error, but we're, we're stuck with it. So 28, the decision on a preliminary issue will be a judgment or order, even if it's limited to a finding of fact. There's no difficulty where the only issue to be decided at preliminary stage is one of fact. It is that issue on which the court has been asked to pronounce a judgment. So no one asked for a judgment on manifest error. And even if the court exercises its power to give judgment against a party on the whole of the case, since that was the issue the court was asked to determine, and since it's that issue on which the whole case ultimately turns, can't say that the whole case turned on manifest error, it will be the determination of that issue which will be the relevant judgment or determination so far as jurisdiction is concerned. So um, then looks at re B. Um, and this is where we get the um, lovely pregnant with legal consequences at D. Uh, if, and then at, just between D and E, if, however, in that case, the court had gone on to make a decision in relation to the legal consequences which one party would not seek to challenge, in my view, that party wouldn't be entitled simply to appeal the findings because it did not like the reasons for the decision in, or, in his or her favour. It's in that context that it might be appropriate Court of first instance consider whether some declaration should be granted to provide a judgment or order or determination which could be the subject of an appeal. Of course, that's not what happened in this case. And then uh, between uh, E and F, 
It's to go beyond the scope of this judgment to consider precisely what circumstances might allow for the granting of a declaration where findings of fact might affect other proceedings. And then it talks about the possibility of issue stopping. And then 29, uh, I turn to the position in this case. There's no doubt that if what the judge had been asked to determine as a preliminary issue, so what's, what's the court being asked to do as a preliminary issue, was whether the parties met and already agreed a figure. And if that was all he was asked to determine, his determination or judgment would have been a judgment or determination which the Court of Appeal had jurisdiction to consider. Um, and then there's also doubt, of course, that whichever side wished to challenge that finding, they would have needed permission to appeal. There's also no doubt that in making that determination, that if in making that determination he had made various findings in his reasoned judgment about where persons were, etc., etc., even if set out as the critical issues by reference to which he would ultimately determine the issue, those findings would not be judgments or determinations, and the Court of Appeal would have no jurisdiction to consider them if sought to be attacked by the party successful on the issue he had been asked to decide. And so if you would turn over the page, please, to 324 of the judgment and paragraph 34. Uh, uh, so here the court uh, looks um, at the uh, uh, legislation um, and then in particular uh, the diff and then at um, what was then um, uh, order 59 and then at 35 it says this that rule recognized the difference between a full cross appeal where the appellant relies on one cause of action and the respondent seeks to uphold the judge on another but different cause of action. So that's the, the two cause of action circumstance which we have in Wolf, but is not this case. Um, and then uh, uh, the second op option is a situation in which the respondent seeks to vary the decision in the court below. I think that responds um, uh, to my lady, Lady Justice Whipple's point. Um, and the defensive respondent's notice seeking to affirm on grounds other than those relied on by the court below. And we say that's us. And then uh, uh, what Lord Justice Waller does is recognise why there are those differences at the end of that paragraph. And he says, this is some recognition of the special position of a respondent simply defending the decision in his or her favour. Uh, now, he uh, develops this point at 37 and says... Is he here still dealing with the old order? Yes, but uh, uh, that's absolutely correct, uh, my law. But we say that the uh, language has not changed uh, such to denude these points of their power and function. Very so similar to, to paragraph 8 of the practice directive. Precisely. Precisely, my law. We don't tend to encourage the citation of authority on the old rules of the Supreme Court for I, obvious reasons. I absolutely and 100% um, agree, my Lord. But what is curious about this case is, first of all, the only authority we have on the current rules is Wolf, And Wolf only deals with the two cause of action situation, which is not here. But also, when Wolf reaches its conclusions on two cause of action, it goes back to all of these authorities. So. In order for us, I say, to uh, 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 understand Wolf properly, we need for ourselves to read these authorities. So I, I, I entirely understand uh, my, lord, my Lord's point, but given we're in this um, slightly because, peculiar territory... Yes. I mean, for instance, the two cause of action thing doesn't find any expression in the rules. No, but it's... That's, in the CPR, I mean. Absolutely, my Lord, but that is how Wolf is decided. Now, um, what uh, my learned friend says is, oh, well, our case is exactly like that. Well, I'm going to come on to, to why that's not the case. But insofar, insofar as Wolf can help us, because it is a case on the current rules, um, uh, I say it's of limited uh, use because it is a two cause of action, especially where we know that this authority, which in includes um, uh, a judgment from Lady Hale, uh, as she later became, and therefore perhaps one to which we ought to give um, some particular weight um, does uh, uh, does underpin the reasoning of the court in the Wolf case. 
So it, if, if, if Wolf hadn't looked at any of this and said, oh, well, look, we're not going to look at any of this case law, we're going to do it from first principles or from the rules, fine. But because of the way it reasons, um, I say that um, uh, it's important for all of us to understand. The but, it, but even without Zinoga, you'd say, or perhaps you wouldn't, but would you say that the position of a respondent simply wishing to defend the judgment by reference to grounds different from those uh, identified by the judge is deliberately delineated and differentiated from the position of a respondent who seeks to challenge the judge's ultimate order. Yes, yeah, and yeah. that is for the reason that the defendant in those circumstances is the successful party and in a uh, special position. Exactly. It's a, it's a matter of analysis, my lady. Because otherwise, if, if one takes a different approach, one could imagine a degree of anarchy breaking out where every time one gets a finding adverse to one's case, one thinks, well, am I obliged to raise an appeal point even though I, I think I'm going to win at the end? You know, and we, we end up with this toing and froing. Or we could have had a situation where a, 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 a defendant, a respondent, would have had to get permission for a respondent's notice, but the rules make fairly clear that you don't need permission. Uh, yes, my lady, I should have put it like that in the first place. Yes, but why, why is there this yes. distinction? There must be a reason for it, and my lady has articulated um, precisely um, that that's the only conceivable reason. that you uh, and, and it's also not a novelty. It's obviously it's been consistently recognised. Um, Ms Morris, can I... Uh, I just want to clarify two things. One, what is your cause of action? I've written down here the, the cause of action, I just want to check I was it right, is whether the NHS was liable for breach of the procurement rules. Is that right? So yes. it's a liability for breach. Yeah. And within that you say there are different component parts and one was whether there was a material whether there was a material breach and the second was whether it was sufficiently serious. And those really I'm sure there's other bits as well, <laughs> but those converge as being the main heads of the liability issue. Yeah. Can I just put on the table, I think, what's in my mind, which is a more familiar NHS scenario, which is a medical negligence one, which is where you might very well have a liability trial, and you might get to the stage where the judge has decided breach of duty, but then can't deal with causation without an adjournment, because it's, everything's changed a bit, which would be quite a good analogue of what happened here. And so just to follow it through, you would say, in that case, everybody sits back and waits for the judge to decide causation before, and you see if there's an appeal on the liability issue. So let's say the NHS has lost on some of its breach of duty points, and you've got some very upset doctors, but the advice would be, can't do anything until we get to the end, and you'd say that's the right answer, wait until causation has been determined, because that's all part of the liability piece, then see if there's an appeal by the claimant, assuming they lose on liability, and at that point, your upset doctors might be able to have their say. Melania, I think it's a, a it's a fair analogy, but what I would say is that there isn't an absolute rule for the reasons that I'm explaining. I think that that's I'm the explained. answer. Is it's it's pretty case specific, and and so you don't want to be too grand in your propositions. It is a matter of analysis of what actually went on in the particular case. Um, and and you know, and what might be relevant is how the case was initially framed by the judge that case managed it. What also might be relevant is perhaps something, you know, a bouleversement happens in the, 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 the hearing and then the judge says, well, actually, I am going to make a declaration because I can see that this all needs sorting out and there's no point in going on to causation until we've got until this we've worked out. It just it, It's just going to depend on the case. But in our case, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the work on sufficiently serious had already been done. You know, so we had addressed the court on sufficiently seriousness first go it was just that uh, the court identified a specific manifest error which none of us had precisely addressed. Uh, and uh, he, we were then given the opportunity to say more about sufficiently serious in the light of that, that particular finding. Um, and so um, also one could imagine a procurement case where perhaps there weren't so many allegations. Um, you know, perhaps there's only a handful um, and then it's possible for the parties to uh, make sufficiently serious submissions first first go around. It, it's it's going to an extent um, depend on the facts of the case. And of course, that we say is why Lady Hale in Sinoga rightly um, uh, 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 emphasised the importance of the, the discretion of the trial judge 
um, and the materiality of that um, in understanding what took place. And um, just to pick up on that before you go to Lady Hale, if the judge had dealt with uh, the manifest error, one of the manifest errors that had been alleged, rather than identifying one that hadn't precisely been anticipated, you would have expected, and the claimants also would have expected, uh, that, that the whole of the liability issues would have been resolved by that stage of the proceedings. That's precisely it. Mm -hmm. None of us expected a distinct... A, a halfway house. Yeah, no one expected that. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 it's quite right. I'm, to... I'm also aware that, I'm not, apart from the, having the subjective sense that I'm going at fair old lick, I'm also not covering quite enough ground. So can I just check that it's okay to keep keep going? Because I've been going for just under an hour. No, I do, yeah. I, I'm speaking for myself. I don't have any other engagement this afternoon. <laughs> so if we do go beyond lunchtime, we'll be upset but not cross. <laughs> is that some... Um, uh, that gives me that, a huge amount it, of comfort. <laughs> We, we're asking you questions. That none of this is easy. These authorities are helpful, but they're not bang on point. There's lots of wider issues, so you carry on. Um, and, and I hope you don't feel that we're putting you under pressure at going at a great lick. You seem to be adopting a, a steady course. I'm grateful for the indication. Uh, so uh, going back then to uh, CNOGA, we're still um, with uh, Lord Justice. Uh, I think that we uh, paused um, at, at the point that we were looking at uh, his identification of the specialness of a defendant at page 324F, and I think I was about to get cracking on uh, paragraph 37, where he amplifies what he has to say about that, that special position. Um, and he talks about the arbitration authorities, which... Um, uh, uh, the uh, court in Wolf uh, don't find quite so persuasive, so I'm not going to um, spend too much time on them, but then I then ask you to go on to page uh, 326 uh, and uh, the, the comment on um, uh, the materiality of, of the fact that there might have been some sort of procedural change, which again just engages with my Lord's point. So uh, uh, the courts had its attention drawn to how where new procedures are brought into play, it's important to look critically at the question whether those new procedures have taken away rights of defence and indeed support the view that in so far as they have not expressly done so, they ought not to be construed as having done so. So we would like to say uh, we're a successful defendant, we were always special, and um, in accordance with my lady, it's just a similar point, we've stayed special. Uh, and so then at 39, it says this, there is thus no doubt in my mind that the position of respondent wishing to defend his judgment by reference to grounds different from those of the judge was deliberately and for good reason maintained under the CPR. Uh, and, though, and there he says, I've no doubt that the judge had the jurisdiction to make a declaration in the form that he did in the literal sense of that term. The question is whether having regard to the fact that, as it seems to me, his purpose was to affect the question whether the defendant should have to obtain permission to appeal if he made the declaration in that form, or would not if he did not, whether it was a proper exercise of his discretion. So that was one of the, the peculiarities in that case, that rather than recitals, there were declarations, and it, and it was to engage with this question of, um, uh, cross appeal or, or respondents notice. So at 40, the Court of Appeal has always had and still has the power to consider whether respondents notice is frivolous or vexatious. So, um, you know, coming back to my Lord's point, it doesn't mean that um, uh, a successful defendant can say whatever it likes. There is some sort of boundary. Admittedly, it's a high one, but it, 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 it it's reflects their special position. I don't think the law reports are groaning with cases in which parts of uh, respondents' appeals were struck out as being frivolous and vexatious. Um, um, I mean, it's a very high test. I, I, I absolutely appreciate that, my lord. 41. Uh, in my view, if the only purpose of a declaration is to put a respondent in a position where he must persuade the Court of Appeal to grant him permission, pursue his defensive respondent's notice, or risk being put on terms in relation to doing so, that is not a legitimate basis for the grant statute hasn't provided the court the power to place that requirement on a defensive respondent 
rules don't provide the court with that power. In my view, it's not a proper exercise of discretion uh, to, in effect, create that power. Uh, then we have got um, Lord, Just Lord Justice Tucky agreeing, and in particular at 48, um, this dealing with the question of the discretion in the trial judge, it wouldn't be a legitimate, expect a legitimate exercise of the discretion to make a declaration if the only purpose of doing so was to put the respondent into a position where permission to appeal had to be obtained for what would otherwise only be a defensive appeal. Uh, that wasn't the judge's only purpose making a declaration in this case, etc., etc. Uh, and then uh, 51, you can see that he agrees about everything else. And then uh, uh, Lady Hale, paragraph uh, 53, uh, she agrees with uh, Lord Justice Tucky. Uh, she's got a, a, a difference, um, and she starts at 53. It's clear that the statutory jurisdiction of court of appeal is to hear appeals from a judgment or order. Uh, it, is, it has long been axiomatic that these words refer to the result of the hearing rather than to the reasons given by the judge for that result. And again, she goes back to Lake and Lake. Uh, and then she says, this ties in neatly with the distinction drawn in the CPR. So the CPR is um, uh, uh, wholly in harmony with that Lake and Lake distinction. Nothing, nothing changed. Paragraph 54, there must be scope for the exercise of some discretion in identifying the result of the case. So again, that's um, my lady, Lady Justice Whipple's point about the, the fact sensitivity for the purpose of embodying it in the court's judgment or order. This is particularly so in the case of a trial of preliminary or separate issues in which many permutations of results are possible. Um, and then it says, look at the forms, etc., etc., uh, And then at 55, uh, dealing with the question of the way in which the discretion was exercised, I agree that matters might be different if his sole purpose in doing so were to impose a permission requirement upon the respondents to the NOGA appeal. So again, it's if you're trying to make it harder for uh, a, a defendant to uh, appeal, that's not on. Um, I, but I see no reason not to accept the assurance from him uh, in his judgment that this was not his sole reason. Uh, nor do I think it was impermissible for him to take this consideration into account deciding how to frame his determination. Uh, and this is the overriding objective of coming back in uh, to enable the court to deal with cases justly. Um, uh, and of course, you're uh, familiar with that. And in that case, you know, it dealt with um, uh, some of the, the costs associated with the, the litigation of its particular character. And so it's an odd old case on the facts, isn't it? Yes, it, it certainly it is. It really is. I think they must have had quite a lot of fun at one point. But it's, uh, I mean, you know, graciously accepting the assurance of the judge. Uh, anyway. There we are. Yeah. Uh, probably the world would be a, a happier place if we all did more by way of gracious acceptance, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, never mind. If we have a look at Wolf, it's behind tab ten. So, sorry, sorry, I haven't quite oh. up. I'm still, I'm still oh. a stage behind. Does everybody agree with Lady Hale? In other words, a judge does have a discretion about how they draft up the order. But what you can't do is to put in a declaration with the sole objective of the um, making the successful defendant have to apply for permission. Is that right? That's what we take. That's what you take. That's your yeah. submission. Yeah. Oh, go on. Yeah. Um, uh, and so Marlena Junior reminds me, and uh, exactly as the court said, the the what Lady Hale seems to be saying is that that the judge can take that into account, um, but it can't be the only reason. Yeah. Do I the mean, others agree? I, I, with well, Lord Justice Waller would have, would have allowed the appeal because he took the view that the judge, that it was not legitimate for the judge to... Exactly, he said the judge didn't have yes. discretion, so there, that, that's so the that's difference the, between them. Yeah. So, uh, but um, certainly for, I mean, because there was no declaration in this case, we say we don't need to grapple with that particular difficulty of all the multiplicity of difficulties there might conceivably be. Um, sorry, may I just turn my back for a moment? So uh, 
Melana Junior, who's spent even longer with Sea Noga than I have, um, says what he takes from it is that they all agree on the principles, but there's a difference about their understanding of what the judge, in He's fact, doing. did. Hence the, the the gracious assurance point. Um, but uh, I wonder, just pausing there, what we've done. I'm sorry if I just pause there and then go to Wolf, uh, which is behind tab ten. So I've already said a, a fair bit about this. Uh, it's much more recent, Court of Appeal, 2018. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Lords Justice is Longmore and Newey and Sir Timothy Lloyd. Uh, uh, and this is where the claimant had, I think, four causes of action, um, fails in relation to three of them, um, and then... Uh, Succeeds, and then what the uh, uh, defendant seeks to do, or is it the other way around? Uh, but anyway, it's, it's a multiple cause of action, and it's where the successful party seeks to challenge. So if you go to the judgment of Sir Timothy Lloyd, uh, it's at 4012 of the authority. Um, and uh, just as I said, um, at 63, goes back to Lake and Lake. Uh, and uh, having gone back to Lake and Lake, if you go over the page to 4014 um, and paragraph 72, then uh, looks at Sinoga and in particular what Lord Justice Waller says about the interpretation of Lake and Lake at 73. So we've got this Lake and Lake properly understood means this, that, and the other. Uh, and then at uh, 74, he goes to uh, the judgment of Lady Hale um, and the relationship uh, between um, the rules and the um, older authorities. Um, and um, again, refers to, at 76, um, this uh, the, the special position point made by Lord Justice Waller uh, and then he goes on to um, how all of that works out um, in Wolf, starting at paragraph 81. Um, and he um, identifies 81, the submission that's being made, which is uh, that uh, where you've got a claim for damages, uh, it doesn't matter whether you've got different causes of action, in this case, procuring breach of contract, procuring conversion and conspiracy. And then at 83, he says, I can't accept that submission. Ms. Morris, it may be a small point. You keep referring to causes of action. Um, I, the word that keeps being used here is claim. claim. It may not matter, but um, um, I, I speak for myself, I remain doubtful that the old order and its reference to causes of actions is... is of any great relevance. They were, they were different claims, claims, and the argument was, well, one was successful, and I want to argue the other ones, because that would have led to the same result in damages. That's precisely it, my lord, yeah. um, and I do apologise. No, it's all right. I just, it, it, may, it may be completely irrelevant, but I, I, think, I, I think, I don't think it's exclusive, but largely the word is claim. But anyway, he doesn't accept the... the the submission, whichever it is, at 83. Uh, which is precisely. I mean, I think in my defence, that phrase, cause of action, comes in at paragraph 87, and so they tend to... Yeah, and, it, it and I think it, or, there's a reference to it also at 81. They're a bit interchangeable, but largely it's claims, I think. You're, you're absolutely right, my lord. But anyway. Um, I do apologise for that. Doesn't matter. So, no, so we're at 83. 83, and he says, I'm, I'm not accepting that uh, uh, at C if... TUSA had wished to do so, it could have appealed with permission against the dismissal of any of its other claims. In practice, absent an appeal, it would not have got permission to appeal against the dismissal of the procuring conversion conspiracy claims, because there would have been no point in such an appeal. But as a matter of jurisdiction, an appeal could have been brought against those dismissals, even though not spelled out in the order, just as it could have been brought against the dismissal of the claim in deceit. And then 85, halfway through 85, Sorry, me again. 
Can we just pause on 83? Because yeah. I think that's quite an important paragraph. I just want yes. to unpack it a little bit, if you would. Um, on your case, what he's saying is the difference between claim and reason. So he's saying there were other claims. So transposing that to this case, if there have been several claims in the, that were dealt with uh, um, by the judge um, and, let's say, led to the June order, what, what he's really saying is you, you would have, there was a right of appeal right at the get-go to start with. You didn't need to wait for anything else to happen because the claims were dismissed, not just reasons found. Okay, so I've just I've caught up. Yeah, so there were, there, I think there were four different yeah. things. So, I mean, I suppose you can imagine a case, breach of contract, negligence, you know. Yeah, yeah. Or, All leading to the same loss. So yes. there was a common relief remedy yes. sort yeah. in that case, but yeah. there were different routes in and they were separate claims. So, for example, one sometimes get in in the in the procurement realm. Um, sometimes there might be a judicial review claim as well as a breach of the procurement rules claim. Uh, perhaps that would be the best analogy. Mm. And so, if one were in that territory, that would map more closely onto this wolf type situation. But where here you've just got breaches of the procurement rules, you haven't got um, a wolf type situation. Um, so then going on to 85, uh, where a court has dismissed, uh, sorry, about halfway through 85, where a court has dismissed one or more of the party's claims, but has given judgment in its favour on another, and that party wishes to contend that the court was wrong to dismiss the first claims, that is not a case of merely upholding the judgment on other grounds. Uh, whether or not the terms in which the order is expressed require any variation, I regard the contention by a respondent that the judge was wrong to dismiss one or more distinct claims as something that requires an amount to be paid. So uh, uh, that is what we say is clearly said by Wolf, and although it's interesting, it's not the answer to our case. Uh, and then uh, I think I've briefly drawn your attention to uh, 87, where uh, uh, what the court says there is they're not convinced by um, the reliance that Lord Justice Waller placed in some of his reasoning on the Arbitration Act, but that wasn't decisive in any event. And so, uh, going on then to paragraph 89, if a claimant asserted two claims against the appellant, of which one was successful and the other was dismissed, whether or not so stated in the resulting order and the defendant appeals against the judgment on the first claim, then if the respondent wishes to argue that the court below was to dismiss its other claim against the appellant and that the order below should be upheld on that basis, that assertion amounts to appeal against the order. So it's, he's saying the same thing again and, and it's not, not our case. But what Wolf does give us, we say, is this continuity over time in terms of the analysis so that the CPR doesn't um, ask this court to, to, to take things in a, in a, in a different way. Now, um, uh, what we have done in an effort to assist the court is try and reduce that case law into a set of legal propositions which we've written down. And would the court be assisted by having that? I wonder if I can just hand that up. Uh, uh, because uh, we understand exactly that there is quite a lot of murk here and we hope that that will um, uh, help in taking things more promptly. Thank you very much. Uh, so that is all that I plan to say about the law. Can, can we just, that's great. Um, we don't expect you to take us through this. Can we just read it yes. wh whilst your submissions are still fresh on the mic? Can you just give us a moment? Absolutely. I'll, I'll sit down.
you very much. Can I just check on paragraph 11? Um, talks about the situation described in 9b above. That must be 10b above, is it? I'm not taking silly points, but I just want to make sure I'm tracking it through. That's 10b. I'm sorry, the lady, I didn't hear. 10b. 10b, in paragraph 11, in the situation described, and it says 9b, it's 10b. And I did actually find another typo, and I was looking at it this morning if while we're on typo. So at 8c, um, it should be 29h, if you ever get that far. 29h? Yes. Whereas I think we've got 28 here. Yep. Thank you, that's very helpful. Since I have made, as I've gone along, my submissions under this heading, unless you have any particular additional questions uh, in on the respondent's notice or cross appeal point, I would um, plan to pause there. Is there any? Are there any other questions? Great. I don't. Uh, Thank so you very much. Then the second aspect um, of what I have to say. Now, I'm, uh, first of all, I'll note that I've now gone on for an hour and a quarter. Uh, and Mr. Moser uh, ought to have the opportunity to say something. I don't something think that gone on is fair. I think you've made <laughs> submissions for an hour and a quarter, and we've carefully noted it. Grateful, my lord. Very kind. Gracious. Uh, if we... Uh, now, that obviously, the second aspect is this question about if we need yeah. permission to appeal, should time be extended, um, and should we have permission? Now, I, I only ask the court whether they would wish to hear from Mr. Moser first on the respondent's notice issue, um, because perhaps of the potential undesirability of starting to get stuck into the merits of those grounds um, at this stage. It's, it's entirely a matter for you. I just thought I'd mention it. Your, your position is this is entirely to be dealt with as a respondent's notice, and even if these are challenges to factual findings, you are <laughs> entitled as a matter of right to make them as a, in a special position as a winner. Is that right? Yes, and also that they are they are not just any old no, no, challenges. No, I, <laughs> no, I understand, but to the, the it may be that they aren't that they're much more nuanced. But to the extent that they are, and there is one Edwards and Bairstow aspect to this, but to the extent that they are, that doesn't matter either. That's your position. That is your primary position. So, and if that's the case, we don't need to get into the merits at all. Um. Well, I, I, I take what you say about the time. Perhaps because, and again, this is probably my fault, that's not something that we had considered. It's almost certain that we will reserve our judgment um, and therefore would reserve it on everything. But um, there may be merit in doing what you suggest in any event. I think the best thing is, um, uh, if you just give us a couple of minutes, so, we'll rise and consider the, the, the best um, procedure to adopt. Thank you very much. Rise.
Welcome, Councillor. Are we ready? Yes, thank you. All right. Mr. Moser, it would be convenient if we heard from you next. Speaking for myself, that's principally because with my head full of this stuff, um, it would be good not to chase that all out of my head with the stuff about the stair climber. So uh, <laughs> instead, uh, it would be good to hear from you on the point of principle. An audience. When uh, your Lordship indicated in opening that uh, your Lordship's antennae twitched <clears throat> when you saw the respondent's notice, uh, one uh, can only sympathise because one uh, has to ask um, whether it can really be right that a respondent may introduce any, at least any non vexatious matter that related to the hearing of manifold manifest error uh, issues in a procurement case as of right without the Court of Appeal having any entitlement to apply the filter of permission and arguability as would be the case in relation to an appeal or a, a cross appeal and perhaps it's not surprising that this has arisen in a procurement that involves a question of sufficiently serious because the Frankovich sufficiently serious issue in procurement matters sits somewhere between liability and quantum. It's a step that doesn't exist, for instance, in the clinical negligence type case that my learned friend addressed and, and, and that indeed my lady, Lady Justice Whipple, mentioned. Uh, and when one comes to case manage public procurement case and thinks about split trials and, and so forth, uh, the, the question often arises, where do we put sufficiently serious? Do we put it in the liability section? Do we put it in the quantum trial? In this case, it was put in the liability uh, section. Uh, it, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, turned out not to work so well because the sufficiently serious rather depends on the nature of the breach. And uh, as the, the judge's thinking is in flight between uh, what uh, he or she's heard about breach and the judgment that's going to be delivered, things will very often simply not have crystallised sufficiently. But those aspects that had crystallised sufficiently were dealt with at that initial so-called liability stage. They were. And, and that, as the parties had agreed they should be. As the parties had agreed they should be. And, and that, I say, is not without uh, significance in this case. Mm. Because uh, we, what we know happened is that what we call their grounds of, of cross-appeal, um, uh, grounds one to four of the respondents' notice, first saw the light of day in draft after the liability judgment. And that's appended to our skeleton argument at page 203 of the hearing file. And so um, what was being ventilated there by a uh, at, at that stage, unsuccessful defendant was that uh, they uh, would wish to appeal uh, if it was necessary to do so. And we see at page 203 um, at paragraph 2, course, the defendant would seek permission to appeal against uh, the conclusion of one, and they are the four grounds in, in material uh, part, the four grounds that we now have transmogrified into grounds one to four of the respondent's notice. Uh, I don't criticise the defendant at all for that. Uh, they were right to ask this question. And indeed, they didn't want to miss their shot at an appeal. Uh, I understand you don't want to um, fall into some sort of error. Uh, and as we will see, the defendant continued publicly to agonise 
proposal whether or not it required uh, a notice of appeal and or respondent's notice right up to the end. And um, there's some reference also to well, you know, what our view was on the matter, but really, uh, it's not really up to us. Uh, it's, it, it ought to be up to uh, the Court of Appeal. And uh, my submission to this Court will uh, be that uh, these are either cross appeals, properly so called, and permission is required, as it would have been had it been brought at the time, or I would submit that uh, under the overriding objective as described by Lady Hay in uh, the Minogue case, the Court of Appeal must have the power to apply a permission filter to a, a respondent's notice in these circumstances. So that's what the same permission filter is would have been applied had this been a cross appeal. Exactly. And, and Which is only just in the circumstances and being fair to both parties. Uh, because that would have been the situation if, for instance, as uh, Lady Justice Simler has suggested, matters have been paused at the liability stage and uh, the appeal had been heard, or indeed had not been paused and the appeal had been heard. I, I, I refer to what happened in energy solutions itself. So that's the case uh, from which we derive the test of sufficient concealment. And if we look at the authorities by Seven. Just going back to your yes. point that the Court of Appeal must have a discretion to apply the permission filter. Yes. Is that in every case where a respondent puts in a respondent's notice, or is it just in some cases? And if so, in some cases, what, which cases? And what, what's the what's the, the scope of the discretion? I mean, it, it must be subject to the usual test where in in circumstances where there would have been an appeal uh, but for the vagaries of the uh, sufficiently serious uh, condition, and I'd, I'd like to keep it to the procurement cases if I can, uh, then um, the Court of Appeal in its case management powers must have the power to be able to say uh, in fact this bit of this respondent's notice is in the nature of an application for permission to appeal. And I will make that good, I hope, when I come to go through the authorities in the particular ward. And, and therefore, under uh, the overriding objective as referred to by Lady Hay, uh, I, uh, uh, as the Court of Appeal judge, uh, am able to apply uh, the light filter as I would if this was an accurate. But the same test, in, in situations, now, upon an analysis of the specific case, and this is the, the point that's made in the case law that my learned friend took the court through, uh, upon a proper analysis, this is in the nature of a cross appeal, not in the nature of a respondent's notice. Um, and I was really advertising <coughs> where I propose to end up, including that alternative. Yeah. And I, I, will, I will say a bit more about that when I come to um, Noga and Wolf. So what happened in, in Energy Solutions was that there was an early hearing. If we turn to um, tab 7 of the authorities bundle, and then within it, um, that's page uh, 155 of the bundle, So there'd been a hearing of, in that case, preliminary issues properly so called, and a, a judgment by Mr. Justice Edward Stewart, and that's at paragraph 10, between the whole punch and the whole part. And then um, what happened is that uh, those uh, preliminary issues went on appeal, and we would see that eventually they reached the Supreme Court, without, however, the, the main trial being paused. So Mr Justice Fraser continued on, on the assumption that the Supreme Court may find uh, a requirement for a sufficiently serious breach. And uh, at the same time, the appeal continued. And we'll see 
that the um, issues varied a little bit uh, over time. So they were a bit different from the ones um, provided by Mr. Justice Stewart at first instance. But they, they included, as it happens, um, over the page at 156, if the claimant has suffered any loss in consequence of any breach, whether the court has any discretion, uh, and if so, on what basis any such discretion is to be exercised, and some other questions. And that eventually came to include the argument that there ought to be sufficiently serious breach of a Frankish conditions. And uh, we see uh, what happened at 13 on page 157. Of course, the P refused um, the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority's application for permission to appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, there was an application to the Supreme Court. Uh, the outcome wasn't known at the conclusion of the trial. But during the drafting of this judgment, the Supreme Court granted permission, although the hearing of that appeal has not yet occurred. It is therefore the case the Supreme Court could find that the so-called Frankovich conditions are imposed. And of course, we know that that is what the Supreme Court did eventually. But Mr. Justice Fraser had no difficulty in carrying on. And nobody had any difficulty in there being an appeal, as it happens, about this very issue of sufficiently serious, uh, as it were, in flight. And so what could have happened at the time of the liability hearing in the present case, uh, after the liability judgment in the present case, is that uh, my learned friend could have proceeded with her points of appeal, her grounds of appeal, in one of two ways. Either the case would have been stayed, or uh, the um, case would have continued on, and uh, at the same time there was an appeal against manifest error. Uh, in fact, what was done, and again, I don't criticise anyone for doing this, I wasn't involved at the time, uh, but what was done is that the case carried on with the question of appeal being so I said that again, the case carried on? The case carried on, but the question of any appeal was effectively stayed, in my reading of it, or left over until the end, rather than doing it in mid-flight. But nobody anticipated that there would be that halfway house stage, and there wouldn't have been had it not been for the judge making the particular finding he did about the error. That's, that's perfectly true. Uh, it's not surprising, however, that it arose in that way. But in, in, in the end, I say, it doesn't really matter. Because for the, for, I, I'm really just taking the court through as to what could have happened, yes. in part addressing your ladyship's point about what you could have appealed at that point. Yes. I, I, I think my learned friend's answer in the end was, well, no. Well, my answer is, well, yes. Because. Would they have had to have a declaration, though, if they wanted to appeal? Would they have been able to appeal a recital? That, that depends on how strictly one sees the need for the order. If one looks at uh, the, the passage in Wolf that my learned friend uh, read not so long ago, yes. and in fact, I think it was your ladyship who said, actually, can we just you know, not, not rush over that passage because it's quite important, or it may have been, my lord. Uh, what uh, was said uh, there uh, is by Sir Timothy Lloyd at paragraph 83, yeah. at page 548. Uh, the order does not in terms record the dismissal of the other claim, but the substance is apparent from the terms of paragraph 2 of the order. And, and so I, I, I do submit that the Court of Appeal quite rightly does not consider itself absolutely hidebound by the very words of the order. And that, so if it's a matter of substance, exactly. there was a, a, a dismiss or a finding against the defendants, they could have appealed. You look at the order and you say, well, how, how did this order come about? Many orders would only say the claim is dismissed. Uh, and then you appeal that. Uh, what would they have appealed here? Well, In June of 2022, what would be being appealed? The fact finding. They, they would have had to bring their factual appeals, as I see them, mm. at the time. Because they would have been, I'm just trying to, in my head, see how it would have been constructed. 
So this is an appeal brought, the NHS would have said, against the judge's conclusions on the facts that paragraphs X, Y, and Z. Yes, but it's a cross appeal. I mean, it depends. So if 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 we haven't reached sufficiently serious here, because we haven't got there, that's that's yes. that's off in in September, and I'm in June. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think I'm in June. Then then they are appealing. So it's not a cross appeal. They are appealing. Mm. And we we know what they're appealing because we've got their draft grounds of appeal, and they are appealing exactly the same aspects they're appealing now. They're saying, well, you you should have um, not said that the witnesses were self-serving. You should, you should have said prams and buggies were taken into account. Uh, you should have remarked the whole thing yourself and come to a different conclusion. That's what they would have... They're appealed. appealing the, fi the fact findings, aren't they? The fact the conclusions. But, yeah. but, well, but what, what would that have been aimed at? Mm. It would have been aimed at overturning the finding of manifest error. Yeah. And, and this is... Uh, this goes to the heart of the matter because... What is the procurement law claim here? What is the, the, the nature of this case? And my learned friend says, well, it's all about damages. Well, the nature of the claim is this was a marking challenge. And a lot was wrapped up in, in that one issue 19, which was all of the manifest errors that were alleged. And, and there's, there's a lot of talk about, well, this wasn't properly pleaded. There, there was a pleading, but there was manifest error in the marking of this question judge found that it was sufficiently pleaded. So let's leave that there. But what is the real meat of this, uh, of this case? The real meat is that there was a manifest error in the marking of my client's tender. Had that manifest error not been made, my client would have received four points instead of three points for question two. The consequence would have been that we would have won. So the real meat of this case, which we come on to, uh, of course, at the substantive hearing, mm. is the wrong bidder won. Mm. Uh, by the time of the final judgment at here, it was too late to do anything about that because the contract had been awarded. But there was a manifest error. And that's, that's the real finding. That's the thing that took evidence and witnesses and many days. Uh, there was then a further hearing, that's the September one your ladyship mentions, mm. that dealt with what should we, what, what's, what's going to be the consequence. But, but just sorry to be um, slow, but those manifest errors didn't actually result in a finding against the defendant because they weren't sufficiently serious. I know that they did, but uh, forgive me. With respect, they, they absolutely they did. led to a finding the defendant had breached the public contracts regulations 2015. But there was no remedy because they weren't sufficiently there was no remedy. Okay. Uh, exactly, exactly. And so I, I see this through a different lens with respect to my learned friend. There was a finding of breach of the regulations, and in, in other circumstances, namely in circumstances where the contract had not already been awarded because of an earlier decision about um, automatic suspension. In other circumstances, that would have been the end of the case. We would have won, we would have been awarded the contract, we would be the incumbent now. Yeah. So that, in a sense, that there can't have been a more obvious, real meat, real finding. It's not just pregnant with legal consequence. Uh, it, it's uh, it, it really um, has gone uh, way beyond that, uh, and uh, you know, I, w I won't take that. Uh, I won't take that metaphor where I was about to take it. But we are we are well beyond uh, we're well beyond uh, that stage. Only because of the vagaries again of this particular case that there had been the lifting of the automatic suspension. Did we move on? to a hearing on remedies that was other than simply, well, you're the winning bidder. And in a sense, uh, although it came about uh, in a heterodox fashion, because suddenly at the end of the first hearing, everyone realized, oh, hang on, it's not so easy to deal with sufficiently 
theories before we've had judgments. Uh, in a sense, the July hearing, which led to the September judgments, was a form of consequentials here. It was to determine the remedies, uh, if any. If this were a, a JR, for instance, um, not involving procurement law, um, there would have been a question of the exercise of the court's discretion at that point. Well, what, was, it, was it really a consequentials hearing? It was just to deal with the sufficiently serious argument. There would then, it was a split trial, there would then have had to be, if that was established, a remedy hearing at which damages would have been There would have had to be a quantum hearing. It's a, it's a, as I so say, it sits it's somewhere a hybrid yes, exactly. situation. It, it sits oddly, a uh, sufficiently serious hearing, sits oddly between a liability hearing and a quantum hearing. It's, as it were, the consequentials of the first bit. But the parties invited the judge, and the judge ordered that, that it should be wrapped up in the li at the liability stage. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. The, the, the parties did. <coughs> yes. And the um, judge acceded. And the judge acceded to that. Um, it, the, the Just consequence... another one question uh, from yes. me. You talked about the lifting of the automatic suspension, yes. which, as I understand it, turned this case into a Frankovich damages. The remedy became Frankovich damages, if it was going to be anything at all. But for the automatic suspension, did I understand your submission to be that there wouldn't have needed to be any consequentials hearing because the answer would have followed as night would have followed day? Or was there always going to be a moment where you had to think about what was the consequence or the consequential of the finding of manifest error, even in a world where there was an automatic suspension in place? Well, I have to be careful here because I, I can imagine a creative defendant saying, no, this is still some sort of discretionary remedy. Mm. Uh, my submission there can be no sensible or reasonable further argument. Once you are, this is a two-horse race, once you are the winner in the marking challenge, that's, that's really the end of it. And uh, the whole point of damages in sufficient to series was only ever amended in the case after the automatic suspension debacle had, um, had occurred. And it's, of course, why this case is a cause célèbre, for slightly different reasons. But this is the case where there has been the lifting of an automatic suspension, then a finding of manifest error, and breach that would have turned the award, and then no damages. And that's the first time that that has happened, and that's why uh, that aspect uh, in, in the other part of the appellant's notice, respondent's notice, is going on appeal. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the point in the underlying appeal. Yes. Which um, I said to my ladies this morning before we came into court, I thought was interesting, but uh, they may take a different view. But uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I think that's a very interesting point. And um, I, I know that the judge below gave permission uh, uh, on that point. In, my in, in the procurement law world. Uh, this is a very big deal indeed. Yeah. And, yep. uh, and this appeal is going to be closely watched. Yeah. And so uh, at, at that juncture, there absolutely could have been an appeal uh, against the finding of manifest breach. Indeed, as I say, but for what I call the vagaries of the automatic suspension finding. Well, they were the losing party, so there That's could right. have been an appeal. Absolutely. But at the end of it, they weren't. Well, at the end of it, they weren't. And so, so then we come um, from that slightly counterfactual yeah. to, the fa to the actual in September. Mm. Um, and what I say uh, about that is two things. Uh, I say, uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, instructive to look at how um, the appeal aspects were in fact structured um, by the court below. And um, if I can ask you, please, to turn up the various orders. The first one is at Theory Bundle, page 75. In my bundle. 
bundle, that's tab 8. It's the, the order of the 21st of June. That's the one with the recitals on page 75. Court finding manifest error, mark should be increased, would have resulted in the claimant's bid being successful, uh, everything else uh, dismissed. Uh, and then at three and four over the page, all other consequential matters are adjourned until judgment on the Frankovitz issue is handed down and for the avoidance of doubt, time for any application for permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal is extended to 21 days after the date that judgment on the Frankovitz issue is handed down. And what does that refer to? At this stage, paragraph four of the order of the 21st of June can only refer to an appeal against uh, the findings at, at 1 to 4 yeah. on page 75. So it's not that it was somehow thought, oh, there can be no appeal. That was expressly held over. We then come to uh, the order of the 16th of September 22. Uh, that's at page 77. Sorry, and did, were the parties in uh, disagreement about that order, or was everybody content to agree that that all that, that that any appeal should await that decision. As far as I know, everyone has always agreed that any appeal should await the end. Yeah. In this case. Yeah. Just as a pragmatic sort of yeah. uh, approach. Uh, one could have suggested no, it must be done yeah. immediately, but they didn't. They didn't. Then at 77, we have the uh, December, sorry, September order. And that's the first uh, evidence of what I called uh, the defendant's agonizing over what it wants to do with its appeal. Uh, there is, uh, in the recital, noted the defendant's confirmation that in the light of both judgments, it no longer pursues its application for permission to appeal. Well, that's logical, of course, because at this stage, we haven't indicated what we were going to do. Um, but th there really was uh, 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 no point in them uh, uh, seeking to appeal. Well, they, could they have at that point? They were, they were the winners. What, what would they have appealed? No, the claim was dismissed. The claim was dismissed, absolutely. How could they have appealed? And why would they? Well, they couldn't. They were, there would have been no jurisdiction uh, in the Court of Appeal to entertain an appeal against the reasons that led to the order dismissing the claim. That, that, that's right. 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 That, that's right. And that's why I say it is slightly different whether you're talking about an appeal or a cross appeal. Uh, that's, again, a very interesting point to me because the, the CPR doesn't talk about cross appeal. It talks about appeals. But what I'm going to say when we look at the, um, the rule is in relevant part, it must be talking about or include the idea of a cross appeal, which is only triggered by a respondent's notice. Okay. I'm still, I'm struggling to see what they could have cross appealed about, unless they went behind the. Well, anyway, you'll come to it. I'm so sorry. Well, well uh, we, we've come to it. So what what happens in in uh, September is that again. Uh, time for any application to the Court of Appeal for permission to appeal be extended to 21 days after judgment in relation to the hearing to be listed and at paragraph 6 of this order. And then finally, in this series of, uh, of orders, at 91 of the And uh, this is the order after a hearing on, uh, on a permission to appeal. We see uh, the defendant reciting its understanding uh, at, um, uh, in the recitals that it has no appeal against any part of the order. 
Further understanding any contention should be upheld for reasons other than those given by this court would properly fall within paragraph 83, need only be raised by way of respondent's notice. So that is, that is the defendant's understanding. Uh, so it wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't uh, a secret that the defendant wasn't quite sure what to do. And permission to appeal is granted over the page 92 at 5. Uh, on one ground, you needn't trouble uh, with the detail. And then at 10 and 11, and importantly, it is ordered by consent. Uh, and, and the defendant asked uh, us and the court to put this in. To the extent that any of the defendant's contention fall contrary to the defendant's current understanding, properly within paragraph 81 of practice direction 52, time uh, is extended uh, for the avoidance of doubt. Any argument properly fallen within paragraph 81 of practice direction 52C would still be subject to the requirement to obtain permission to appeal, such permission to be sought from the appellate court in the first instance. Now, one asks rhetorically, what was the point of 10 and 11? if the defendant had a settled understanding that he didn't need permission, indeed, that the Court of Appeal was in no position to insist on permission. But nonetheless, it was put in there. <coughs> uh, and of course, as we see it, uh, on analysis, uh, and I confess, we weren't particularly troubled by their difficulties at the time. We had our own uh, difficulties to deal with. Uh, on analysis, you have an appeal uh, that could have been brought against the liability judgment that is then overtaken. Sorry, when could an appeal have been brought? At the against time of the liability judgment. Well, the June judgment or the September? The June order the or the September order? The June. So they, they could have appealed against the June order right. had, had matters been different. That, that appeal was held over to the end. Uh, what happens is that that appeal, we say, on analysis has become a cross appeal because it arises upon uh, us appealing and in response uh, to us appealing. And what we say is the correct reading of the situation and this succession of orders is that these appeals and cross appeals were all held over to the end as they arose from time to time rather than dealing with them and pausing uh, procedures stage. They are dealt with uh, sensibly at the end. But I say that that does not mean that uh, on this uh, key issue of manifest error and breach of the regulations, the uh, defendant can simply be said to be in a defensive position as a respondent and raise any and reopen any aspect of uh, the manifest breach. And I say that the correct reading of that is, is that what would properly have been an appeal in June has properly become a cross appeal in September. And that is triggered by uh, our respondents' notice. And I say that that works with the way that the CPR and uh, the practice direction are drafted. So if we look at page 1782 of the White Book, and at the respondent's notice, CPR 5213. 5213.1. A respondent may file and serve a respondent's notice here. Two, a respondent who A, is seeking permission to appeal from the appeal court, or B, wishes to ask the appeal court to hold the decision of the lower court for reasons different and so on, must file a respondent's notice. And uh, when the respondent seeks permission, it must be requested in the respondent's notice, and that is at three. Now, what I uh, uh, submit is that all of this only arises if there's been an appeal. Sorry to state the uh, So when it says a respondent who is seeking permission to appeal from the appeal court, that must of necessity include what we call a cross appeal. So it should be read as includes a respondent who is seeking permission to cross appeal from the appeal court. 
And I uh, say that grounds one to four of the respondent's notice, having always been in the nature of an appeal at the stage when they were unsuccessful, hasn't suddenly uh, become simply other reasons. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that if you look at the case uh, in, in the way that my lady, lady Justice Whipple has uh, discussed, if you look at it on its facts, what I call the real meat, the real underlying uh, decision, by Lord Lord Justice Goulston called it the root and branch, is manifest error of breach of the regulation. And it, it simply cannot be right as a result that us having put in an appeal on sufficiently serious it is suddenly open to a respondent to attack another issue that was in fact the main issue right up to uh, the sufficiently serious here. So if we test that by the clinical negligence example my lady put to uh, Ms Morris. Yes. If you have a trial where there is an issue about, about negligence and causation leading to um, uh, damages and there's a split trial and findings of breach are made and the judge then says well hold on I can't deal with causation I need some more evidence different evidence from the evidence that's available um, at, at, the, at the stage at which there's an adjournment or a stay or whatever it is, the defendant is, is unsuccessful on a preliminary basis, but they go on to deal with questions of causation and they succeed on causation. So end of, at the end of the second hearing, they are the winning party. The fact that they might have been able to appeal the breach decision, you would say on your argument, means that when uh, there is an appeal by the claimant against the final dismissal of his or her claim, they must cross-appeal against the causation finding. They cannot just put in a respondent's notice. Sorry, cross-appeal against the breach findings. They can't just put in a, a respondent's notice, uh, even though they are the winning party. I'm going to answer that in two ways. Uh, the first way, I hope not too defensively, is that of course my submission is limited to the circumstances of my case. This procurement case with these three orders has kept carrying over the appeal points up to the end until we arrived where we arrived in December. So that, that's my first answer, which is that uh, in, in this particular two important aspects. The first is we have three orders, each carrying over, each carrying over the appeal points uh, uh, to the end, including the denouement of paragraphs 10 and 11 of the last order, saying you know, if you need permission you'll have to seek it to them. That's after we've already had our permission to appeal. And that, little Roman two, in circumstances where it's a procurement case with the main issue having gone our way and uh, then sufficiently serious the slightly exotic I think my learned friend's term was issue having later cancelled out our win so that's my first answer I'm sorry uh, but I, I, I make that for a reason because before I venture onto the thin ice of clinical negligence cases for me thin ice uh, I want to be on the firm ground of the, the that's what case. you say here in principle, I submit, uh, it ought not to be uh, impossible for the Court of Appeal to look at a respondent's notice in that clinical negligence case and say, well, hang on, uh, this does rather more than simply
simply say other reasons. Say that we have a very complicated uh, clinical negligence case. Um, massive trauma, um, a series of different interventions by different health professionals and clinics. Many experts were called. Uh, three months of trial. Uh, and uh, it is found that there was negligence uh, for a series of complicated reasons, including findings about duty of care and so on. Um, there is then a further hearing. And for some uh, entirely unrelated reason, and let's remember the further hearing in this case was just half a day, for some fairly unrelated reason, in half a day, all of that is cancelled out because of some Novus Actus interveniens uh, that has emerged from further evidence. And, uh, uh, and there is no cause of action. The uh, child, uh, child representatives, I don't know why I assume the child, but the, the claimant's representatives appeal on the Novus Actus point, on the causation point. Well, they would be appealing the order dismissing the claim, yes. not just yes. they would, that. That would be what they'd appeal. That's what, but, but that they'd be challenging the reasons around causation. Exactly. But that's how it always is. So you know, my learned friend says, "Oh no, you know, it's the order of dismissal." You, you're always challenging the order that dismisses. But of course, what you're really challenging is the Novus Actus point that, that explains it, and that's the point in Wolf. So you look at the order, and nobody can understand. This case is dismissed on its own. If you come to it afresh, it means nothing. So you can only understand it in context. And the context of this case is there was a nervous actus point on which the claimant eventually lost in that case. And then in the respondent's notice, the NHS trusts, or whoever it may be, um, bring back all of the points that were heard over the four months the expert points, the duty of care points the difficult points around the different um, uh, allocation of liability and so on. Can the Court of Appeal really, I ask rhetorically, not do anything about this? I say, well, hang on, this is uh, you know, anything less like a respondent's notice I've never seen. This is a cross appeal, and it should be seen through the filter of the Commission. And is there anything in the rules that, that supports you? in that submission, or any authority that supports you, apart from what we see in Wolf. Well, I, I, would, I would come on to why I say um, that Wolf supports me, and, uh, and indeed B. Okay, so Wolf and B, but, but, not, but there's nothing in the rules, because the rules do make a distinction, don't they, between a respondent's notice and a cross appeal? Yes, they, they do. But they do say, under respondent's notice, the respondent who is seeking permission to appeal from the appeal court must file a respondent's notice. Yeah. And where the respondent seeks permission from the appeal court, it must be requested in the respondent's notice. There's actually a box to tick for that. Yeah. But if you if you don't need permission, you don't have to seek permission. You don't have to seek permission. So, what, what the what the rules say is a respondent who is seeking permission to appeal. And my reading of that, I submit, is that if what the respondent is in practice doing is seeking permission to appeal, and on an issue that is other, in fact, than the issue uh, which is in the appellant's notice to appeal, then what they're actually doing is they're appealing, they're cross appealing, and so they need permission. Simply by putting what is in substance of appeal in the respondent's notice, you cannot circumvent a requirement for permission. Otherwise, there would be a real uh, floodgates or coach and horses or whichever metaphor you prefer problem. So, would you, I'm sure you're going to get to this, Mr. Moser, but could you help us on where you say the line lies between the difference between permission to appeal and, or just an appeal and seeking to up? hold the decision of the lower court for different reasons. 
Yes. May I, may, may I turn to the authorities? Yeah. And uh, you have my submissions on the old authorities uh, and why I say that what matters most is war. But not least out of deference to uh, my learned friend and also to the way it's looked at it, I will start uh, with the uh, old authorities. And I'd like to start very briefly with Lake and Lake simply because it's the Fonds in Oregon case, and that's an authorities bundle one. Uh, that is a very ancient uh, uh, authority now in many ways, not least because uh, it is the most extreme in case imaginable. There was a standard form of order for these commissioners' decisions in divorce cases. Uh, essentially, you just trotted them out. Uh, depending on which way you found. And um, uh, Commissioner Sir Harry Trusted QC uh, had uh, trotted one out. And then in, uh, in the discussion after judgment, the recorded transcript, and that's at page 148, it really matter. But the recorded transcript uh, recorded a conversation between the Commissioner and Council, where Council said, well, it, you know, to be clear, we're we'll Lordship's judgment, you find adultery. And the commissioner, yes, I think so. And that was the thing that, understandably, uh, Mrs. Lake objected to. But you had a, an order that was utterly boilerplate. She had won. And then you had a, a throwaway remark. Uh, so, so there it is. And she may have been barred from challenging that by raised judicata. But nonetheless, that was the result. Yes. That, that was the result. Although, in practice, it was pretty unlikely to matter because it was only if someone was going to sue on that uh, in, uh, uh, in some way. Uh, well, the no, MR said it had, might be a very serious consequence. It, it, it might, and, and you know, dare I say it, but if that had come before Lady K, uh, 50 years later, the outcome might well have been different uh, once there was the overriding objective and uh, other matters. In fact, uh, 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 dare I say, I would be astonished if the outcome had not been. So that's uh, Lake and Lake. Uh, it's always recited as the starting point of this, but I, I do think it's, it's high time uh, that um, 25 years after the CPR, uh, Lake and Lake is uh, allowed to, to rest uh, on its case. Uh, we then have, more importantly, perhaps, uh, the matter of in re B, and uh, as we saw, that was a case where matters did rest uh, at the moment of the finding that was being appealed, uh, and uh, in a sense, in re B, if we look at page 14 of the bundle, page 793 of the report, is the counterfactual that could have happened in our case. So the decision... Uh, which was crucial to the final decision of the court. That's uh, Dame Elizabeth Butler's loss, the president at E. The decision that was crucial to the final decision of the court as to where this child should live and who, that could be appealed. And it was appealed in this case even without any order being drawn up at all. So that is how flexible uh, these rules can be. And we see again between G and H that part that my learned friend almost read to the court, but didn't, um, uh, between G and H, such is issues which are determined as a preliminary part of the case, and that's why my learned friend stopped. I continue, which are crucial to the final determination, can be treated, if appropriate, as a determination for the purpose of allowing the court of appeal to hear it, without waiting for the second part of the hearing. Determination, of course, being the word in the county court act. And so it is here. In our case, the finding of breach was crucial. If there had not been a breach, there would never have been a July hearing. There would never have been a September order. The finding of manifest error and breach of the regulations were absolutely crucial to everything that came up. And I say the fact that it was appealed not in June, but 
but uh, held over until December, ought not, in the structure of our case, to make any difference to whether or not permission is required. It's very much a finding, uh, an issue, uh, crucial to a case capable of uh, being appealed, and that should require permission, whether brought as an appeal, full stop, in June, or as a cross appeal in December. Because as I submit, in uh, the room, the word appeal must include a cross appeal. Indeed, that, that is probably what it, uh, what it means, because it, it is an appeal that only arises after a notice of appeal. It only arises upon a respondent's notice being triggered. Uh, and uh, how does that work in relation to uh, the fact that uh, my learned friend says, well, but in the end, we won. There's only one fight, only one decision. Uh, and I said, oh, well, that is not how the authorities approach it. If we look at uh, NOGA 3, which is certainly the high point of my learned friend's case, and that's why my learned friend uh, relies so much on NOGA 3 and, and so little on Wolf. And that's particularly noticeable in her written propositions. Uh, and if, it, if NOGA had been the last word, it might assist her more. Uh, but NOGA has... Uh, NOGA suffers, uh, in my respectful submission, very much from the fact that it is, uh, as I think my, Lord, uh, my, my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Coos has said, a very odd case. And uh, with great respect for all concerned in that case, and in particular my learned friend Mr. G, uh, there seems to have been a certain amount of overthinking going on at the first instance, which led to a rather strange question being put to the Court of Appeal. And we see that um, probably most conveniently at page 326 uh, at 39. Uh, that was the, the bit about the CPR, my learned friend, put it to. And that's where Lord Justice Waller explains at 39 um, uh, the question, that's between D and E, one, two, three, four, five lines down. The question is whether, having regard to the fact that, as it seems to me, his purpose, the judge's purpose, was to affect the question whether the defendant should have to obtain permission to appeal if he made the declaration, but would not if he did not, whether it was a proper exercise of his discretion to put the declaration in that form. And as a, as a question, uh, uh, once one's got um, one's uh, wet towel around one's head, uh, one can um, perhaps answer it, but then we'll see it's not a particularly uh, helpful question to have to answer, and a very narrow one. Uh, and of course, the whole case is about uh, an appellant, um, and uh, uh, appealing something that was essentially a sort of manufactured, manufactured question. Uh, but. Uh, where we end up is this point that my learned friend made, uh, and this is in the judgment of Lord Justice Warren, that this is uh, a defensive respondent who is, is to be given greater latitude. And I say uh, that no, in this instance, if you look at the facts of our case, grounds one to four cannot be properly uh, characterized as purely defensive. They are offensive in the sense of being used as a sword and not a shield. And uh, 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 they are aimed at a different issue in the case. And the judgment that I would particularly commend uh, in B is the judgment of Lady Justice Hale as she then was. Both of us, I note, particularly rely on Lady Hale's judgment, uh, but I read it rather differently. Uh, Lady Hale at H on page 328 mentions Lady Hale and how this ties neatly with the distinction in the CPR between a cross appeal 
which the respondent is seeking to get a bearing result, for which he needs permission, and upholding the decision on other grounds, for which he does not. And then but, my learned friend skipped over the but, but it's an important but. My learned friend read the next bit. There must be scope for the exercise of some discretion in identifying the result of the case for the purpose of involving it in the court's judgment or order. This is particularly so the case of trial of preliminary or separate issues in which many permutations of results are possible. So uh, Lady Hale uh, has two uh, possible issues. There's a preliminary issue and a separate issue. And uh, I submit that where one is looking at a case and identifies that what the cross appeal is doing is attacking a separate issue, then uh, we are uh, properly in, uh, in the territory of what um, the rule calls an appeal rule on respondents' notices, uh, we are properly in the territory of requiring, uh, requiring permission. And whether that is because they are seeking to appeal against any part of the order as properly interpreted, or whether that is they're seeking a variation of the order uh, in the sense uh, that when you trace the genesis of the order back, you find that it must trace back to the manifest error breach of the regulation, and they want to vary that aspect of it. Uh, I don't uh, need to um, say which route is more obvious. So there are both potential routes by which you reach the conclusion that a permission, uh, that permission is required. Just remind me, does it say variation of the order, or does it say? Well, the, yes. The, so the, the so rule. The rules, yes. So what, says, what, which part of the order are you saying should be varied? 52.13 says a respondent who is seeking permission to appeal from the appeal court. Yes. No elucidation. Yes. Uh, but the pre have but a the paragraph page. Practice direction says either a respondent who seeks to appeal against any part of the order made by the court below must find an appeal notice, or two, a respondent who seeks a variation of the order of the lower court. So on, on your analysis, what part of the order are they either seeking to appeal or to vary? Well, on, on the sort of reading of an order that uh, we see in, uh, in Wolf, it is the part of the order uh, that um, is the, how should I put it, I think that the phrase in B was the crucial uh, aspect or, or similar. It, is, it was crucial to um, the order that there was a finding of breach um, because without the finding of breach, there would have been no Frankovich hearing. Without the Frankovich hearing, there would have been no dismissal. Uh, so simply because it's made in two steps rather than one, I say, it makes it no less either uh, a, an appeal against a part of the order or variation of the order. And, and I, I submit that that is entirely uh, consistent with any normal appeal. So the normal appeal is against an order that says, I dismiss your claim. Again, the appeal is obviously not against just that. It is against the lowest actors or against the sufficiently serious. That is the immediate finding. Uh, and would you make the same submissions in this case had it all been dealt with in one go? With one hearing, one order dismissing the claim, but findings of manifest error that were not sufficiently serious to give rise to a remedy? Yes, I would. You would? And, and, yeah. and, and again, I, I answer it in two ways. You know my little Roman one is, well, that's not the case, because yeah. of, the, because of yeah. the way the orders work. Uh, I'm not in that situation. Little Roman II, yes, because, because of, of, of this um, concept that I've just uh, introduced, well, that Lady Justice Hale introduced in 2003, of separate issues. And I'll, I, I'll expand on that in a moment via Wolf. But if you have uh, a respondent's notice in a case where the appeal, the notice of appeal, 
is against a finding of sufficiently serious, or whatever. But that's this case. And you get a respondent's list that uh, attacks the separate issue, brackets, moreover, a separate issue that happened to arise in a discrete part of the case that could have been appealed at the time, Judge Black. Then I say either that has to have permission pursuant to um, the, the, um, the rule 5213, or uh, it's something where the court, under Rule 1.1, the overriding objective, is able to intervene. And that, I take, from E, if we're still on page 329, Noga 3. Lady Justice Hay, the overriding objective under CPR 111 is to enable the court to deal with cases justly. CPR Rule 112 expressly provides that dealing with a case justly includes, so far as is practicable, ensuring that the parties are on an equal footing, saving expense, dealing with the case in ways which are proportionate, among other things, to the financial condition of each party, ensuring that it is dealt with expeditiously and fairly, and allotting an appropriate share of the court's resources. Um, and we have a G. If the reality is that an appeal against that finding would have no real possibility of success, it is scarcely in accordance with the overriding objective. So I say, look at this case. Uh, we um, are in a situation where we have had to get permission to appeal, having won everything uh, 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 that we needed to win until it was sufficiently serious. Uh, the other side says that uh, this is now our opportunity, without the Court of Appeal being able to do anything about it, to introduce, reintroduce the underlying defensive argument. Uh, bearing in mind also that the other side are the NHS, my clients are essentially a husband and wife team. I know it's a limited company, uh, but it's two people. Uh, Mr. Spathodos is sitting at the back of the court. Uh, uh, they are essentially two individuals. And uh, are they justly and fairly to be faced with having to relitigate the question of manifest error? Essentially on the facts, I, I add, we can have that argument later, but no. It, it cannot be uh, right that, of course, when we come to the question of permission, I would uh, strenuously uh, uh, argue that there is no real prospect of success anywhere on grounds one to three. Is it really to be said that the Court of Appeal can't do anything about that we're going to have to go forward to the appeal hearing with all of these points about prams and buggies and stair climbers and uh, whatnot uh, hanging over our heads and the Court of Appeal's uh, heads having to work up all of the arguments and so on to delve back into the evidence. Uh, no, uh, there must be a way of doing it, and it's either the permission filter, or, or if not, uh, it's Lady Hale's uh, CPR 1.1. Uh, and in, in, there isn't much uh, time before lunch, but I would like to turn to Wolf, because I keep trailing Wolf. Can we just um, take stock of yes. uh, Noga number three? Um, in answer to my earlier question, I think I think Wolf is going to help us as well on your argument. Do you say, or I've noted that your, the distinction you draw between a cross appeal and an additional reasons approach is whether the respondent's attack goes to an issue which is separate from that which is under attack in the substantive appeal? Yes. And that's the ball you have to keep your eye on. That's the distinguishing feature. That's the ball. But alternatively, in any event, the court under the overriding objective can treat a respondent's notice as a cross appeal where the court considers it appropriate to do so, applying the overriding objective. Lady, yes. So there are two ways home, you'd say. Yes. So, so then we come to Wolf. And uh, we, we do say that Wolf is important. It is not completely important. But it's important, it's the only case uh, since uh, the CPI. Um, we, of course, say, and we've said in writing, that we say we are sort of reverse Wolf. Um, wolf is about the claimant uh, seeking to appeal. This is about the defendant seeking to appeal, at least as we see it. 
It's a case uh, that answers, in my submission, my lady's question about how properly to characterise what a respondent is trying to do. So it, it does go to a point. Uh, if we look at um, uh, paragraph 23 at page 4004, Trinity Logistics, too, sir, made four claims against Mr. Wolfe. The first was procuring a breach of contract, uh, and there were certain others, including deceit and conspiracy. And uh, we know that one was upheld, the others uh, were uh, not, and at 32, page 4006, two to serve the respondents, note is saying the judge should have upheld the claim, claims of procuring conversion and conspiracy against Mr. Wolf. And there is a debate about whether TUSA needs permission to appeal for this purpose. And I'd like to go to uh, Sir Timothy Lloyd's judgment uh, in uh, this. Uh, that there is indeed a discussion of the old cases, but I'd like, to, if I may, go straight to paragraph 82, because I know the friend has covered this. Counsel for Wolf at 82, page 4017, contended that TUSA could not have appealed at all against the dismissal of the conversion conspiracy claim. To support that, he argued the order against which a party can appeal is that part of the document which has to be and can be enforced, not the reason. On that footing, he submitted the reference in paragraph 2 of the judge's order that a particular course of action is not part of the order for this purpose. And what is relevant is that judgment was given against Mr. Wolf and relief granted in paragraphs 3 and 4. And may I pause there and say that's rather similar, I think, to our case, where we're told, don't, don't, look, don't bother with the recitals in the original order, uh, or rather the... Um, well, is it similar? Uh, this, these are four separate causes of action or claims. Yes. Deceit, conversion, breach of contract. There was only one cause of action or claim in, in our case. It's just... Uh, issues arose in the course of determining that claim uh, at different stages. So is it is it really similar? I say it is. It is at least analogous because uh, whether one sees these as different causes of action or different issues, in the words of Lady Hay, uh, it ought, in my submission, not to make any difference. The, the court does fall back into the language of causes of action. For instance, we see it paragraph 86. But in my submission, uh, it is not relevant or determinative whether it's necessarily a different cause of action, whether it's a separate issue. And, and perhaps it's an echo, still, uh, after all this time, of the forms of action uh, that, that fascinated uh, everyone until the 19th century. Uh, but what was eventually said about those, of course, was that uh, if they appear before you clanking their medieval chains, you should walk straight through them. And I say the same about this distinction between uh, causes of action and uh, issues. In a procurement case, sorry to keep coming back to procurement law, but that's this area. In a procurement case, it's a very different issue as to whether you're dealing with manifest error in a market channel or when later on you're dealing with sufficiently serious breach. The, the latter hadn't even been pleaded originally. And it wasn't that there wasn't a cause of action originally. So the original claim didn't even include a claim for damages. That was a, an issue or a cause of action or call it by what you will. It was only introduced when it became necessary after the automatic suspension rule. And uh, I say that Sir Timothy Lloyd's approach at 83 is with respect commendable. He didn't accept the submission by counsel for Wolf. The order does not in turn recall the dismissal of Tusa's other claims, but the substance, the substance is apparent from the terms of paragraph two of the order. Uh, that pausing there, I say likewise, the substance is apparent to all of us. We needn't uh, shut our eyes to what we all know about this case and what lies behind the simple words, the claim is dismissed. If Tusa had wished to do so, it could have appealed with commission against the dismissal of any of its other claims against Mr. Wolf. In practice, absent an appeal by Mr. Wolf, it would not have gone commission to appeal against the dismissal of um, conversion conspiracy because there would have been no point. But 
as a matter of jurisdiction, an appeal could have been brought against those dismissals, even though not spelled out in the order, just as it could have been brought against the dismissal of the claim of the seat. Now, that is why Wolf is in reverse, because that is slightly different in this case. So we have to look at how Wolf applies when it's the defendant. And the defendant, uh, as Sir Timothy Lloyd says, and I accept, uh, and that's at uh, 401C, uh, 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 he says, I accept that the range of defensive positions open to a respondent defendant may be wider than those open to a claimant. Sorry, where are you reading from? Um, 86, last sentence. 86, sorry. Um, sorry, page 401. The range of defensive positions open to a respondent may be wider than those open to a claimant because the defendant is less likely to wish to challenge the lower court's ruling against him on a separate course of action. So yes, they may be uh, wider because you're not going to uh, challenge it on a separate uh, course of action. Here, um, Sir Timothy Lloyd has slipped into the language of the course of action. I say it's the same if you say a separate issue. The, um, the defendant is less likely to wish to challenge the lower court's ruling against him. But where I submit Sir Timothy Lloyd and I would agree, I say with trepidation, is that, uh, uh, with respect, is that if the, if the defendant does seek to challenge a separate issue in the case, does seek to challenge a separate issue in the case, then that is not within the range of defensive positions open to a respondent defendant. That is a cross appeal, properly so called. And it can't be limited to frivolous and vexatious, forgive me. Can't be limited to frivolous and vexatious. A respondent should not be entitled to tip everything that was in the main part of the main body of the hearing back into the respondent's notice and onto the desk of uh, your ladyships at, at my lord uh, without the court of appeal having any power of affinity. Uh, that is a, a, a an outcome that must be wrong. And so when we come to 89, and I'm conscious of the time, uh, but I can probably finish, uh, depending on questions, in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Well, why don't you do that, and then, and then we'll pause there. Uh, I'm great. So 89, yeah. So 89. Uh, I said, in the circumstances of this case, where they are challenging um, cross-appealing, we say, as a separate issue, one can read 89 straight into our case and just reverse it. If a claimant asserted two claims, two issues, uh, separate issues against the respondent, of which one was successful and the other was dismissed, whether or not so stated in the order, the claimant appeals against the judgment of the second, then if the, re if the respondent wishes to argue that the court below was wrong to uh, uphold the other claim against the appellant, then uh, they should uh, be obliged to seek permission to appeal. And, and that is my answer to my learned friend, and also to her legal propositions. So the, uh, uh, just a short question. Had the claimant not appealed in this case, on your argument, the defendant could have appealed because there were two issues, even though they were the winning party. Forgive me, no, that, that, that's not my argument. So that, that, my uh, argument is that their cross appeal is only triggered by our appeal. I, I, I can see that. So they're in a different position as, as respondents to an appeal. They are. And, and they so they have a much greater appeals. latitude than okay. we have, as far as permission is concerned. And they can make all the points they wish to make and have made in points, whatever it is, five to seven, yeah. their respondents notice without permission for appeal. But if if they want to appeal, so that's that part of uh, Rule 52.13, uh, that is in 52.13.2a, if they want to appeal, uh, they need permission. And the fact that their appeal has only been triggered or revived by the fact that we have appealed is, not, is nothing to the point. That, that's in the nature of Rule 52.13. Until, unless and until we have a notice of appealing, a respondent hasn't got a locus to find and serve the respondent's notice. Forgive me, that's obvious. But, and it's, the, it's, it's in that context, 52.13.1, a respondent may find and serve the respondent's notice, that we even get to 52.13.2 and the cross appeal. 
Though a cross appeal is different in nature from an appeal, a part of the difference of a cross appeal uh, is that it does not necessarily arise, not necessarily arise uh, uh, until um, an appeal has been One could probably imagine other scenarios where they could appeal anyway uh, with permission, but that's not this case. All right. Uh, and so, well, I, 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 shall I leave over um, such response? I mean, my, my answers to my learned friend's propositions are probably obvious. Um, if, shall I go through them very briefly? Um, no, I think we'll rise, and we'll come back at five past two, but um, we may, and we'll, we'll see where we are and um, what else we need to address. So we'll come back at five past two. All right.